Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Studying the Glymphatic System Using Light Sheet Microscopy. I am Megan Pascal of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Melteni Biotech. To learn more, visit meltenibiotech.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Eben Lundgaard, PhD, Associate Professor, Lund University, Sweden. We will now have a brief introduction from Dr. Eliza Nent. Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Elisa Nent. I'm the product manager for neuroscience working at Milton e Biotech. And I'm very happy um, to introduce you the webinar about studying the glymphatic system using light sheet microscopy by Eben Lundgaard. And um, before um, we go on and Eben starts, I will give a short introduction and also tell you a little bit about uh, Milton e Biotech. So just some fast facts, the company was founded in 89, uh, expanded, uh, so right now we have over 4,000 employees worldwide from over 50 nationalities. Um, a quarter of our employees are working in R&D, so we are still developing um, a lot and trying always to be innovative and on top of um, research. You can see here some examples about our technologies um, from Milton Biotech. So I will not go into detail, but um, I hope you can appreciate that we try to cover many different technologies and many areas to give really a lot of benefits um, to the to researchers in the lab. So coming to the um, solutions that we have, especially for neuroscience, which I think are most interesting for you today. As you can see here in this image, we created this to kind of show that we have several approaches. So on one hand, we have kind of um, a dissociating brain because we have um, a workflow that you can use to dissociate the brain tissue and isolate cells. But we also have, on the other hand, a workflow for the imaging of the brain, which I think are both quite uh, important um, approaches to study the brain. And um, just very shortly, so that you get an overview, our workflow for this dissociation for the analysis um, starts with sample preparation where we have dissociation kits and uh, the gentle max, like an automated dissociator. For cell separation, we have different micro beads that are labeled magnetic beads to isolate cells. For cell culture, we have media and supplements. And for the analysis, we have a flow analyzer and sorter. But then more important um, for today is our imaging workflow where we have a set of antibodies clearing kit and a nice uh, microscope that I will also explain you further in the next slides, um, which is really working hand in hand and makes this um, approach to study the brain in 3D uh, more easy. So our antibodies, for um, especially for 3D immunofluorescence, um, have a low cost. Uh, they are all fluorochrome conjugated, which gives you um, faster results. So it's easier than uh, working with the first uh, primary and secondary antibody. Um, and they're recombinant and give you reproducible um, data. And um, then for the next step, the tissue clearing, um, maybe most of you or some of you have heard of this. Basically, what you do is you render the tissue transparent. Uh, by this, we add uh, ethanol for the dehydration and the solvent for the matching of the refractory index, which then, as you can see here, turns the brain tissue within several hours almost transparent, making it possible to then analyze really every layer of the brain. 
we have uh, different uh, tissue clearing reagents like solution and a kit. Um, they are a so organic solvent and uh, non-toxic, which means they are quite safe, but still work fast and efficient. We have several protocols that are directly optimized, uh, for example, for the brain and are quite easy to use. Coming then to the ultra microscope um, blaze. So this is also what will be um, later mentioned in Eben's talk. Uh, this is a light sheet microscope. And you can see here some examples about um, when it was used in, in several publications uh, for the analysis of the brain, for example, but also for other tissue. And um, light sheet microscopy actually covers this gap, which you can see here in the uh, microscopes that you maybe heard of before, confocal microscopy, two photo microscopy, that cover more the smaller sizes in the cell, let's say, or the MRE that covers directly the whole brain and then kind of in the middle is this ultra microscope, um, which is kind of showing cell um, structures, but also kind of includes the whole brain anatomy. So you can even track um, connections of neurons or see their location within the whole um, organ. Um, and some features of the place is that um, basically you are uh, able to image large or even multiple samples, um, which means that you have uh, directly a high output and um, but still uh, reduced hands on time. Uh, what is also um, very nice is that it works fully automated, so that's quite easy. It can be operated by every lab member and um, you don't have to sit so much yourself on the microscope. You can let it work for you. And we have a set of different um, optimized optics, uh, which give you high data quality, but also high sensitivity. So as a summary, and I don't want to take too much time of you today, um, just to highlight that this uh, ultra microscope blaze is a fully automated light sheet uh, microscope, which can image multiple samples with a high resolution. It has cutting edge optics that provide a high image quality and sensitivity, and is enabling to image large scale 3D um, organs at a high resolution. And and with this, um, I'm at the end of my part. Um, and I just wanted to show you here this nice video of a brain that was imaged with the UM place. Um, but now, actually, I want to continue um, and in the end now introduce to you our speaker of today, which is uh, Eben Lundgaard. So um, Eben is an associate professor at the Lund University and uh, is the principal investigator of a research group of around 12 people that are studying the lymphatic system in the context of neurological diseases. Um, the lab was founded five years ago and has since then published many papers in uh, high impact journals. So um, the lymphatic system is actually quite new and it's an exciting topic that becomes more and more relevant in um, neuroscience. So maybe you've heard of this also before and that's why you are tuning in, or maybe you were just interested to hear more about the lymphatic system. Um, but in any case, I'm uh, very much looking forward now to her talk. I think it's a very exciting topic. And um, I think with this, I'm at the end. So even thanks for agreeing to give this talk and the, the, the virtual stage is now yours. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this LabRoot webinar on the lymphatic system and light sheep imaging. My name is Eben Lundgaard, and I'm an associate professor at Lund University. All right, so today I will be talking about what the lymphatic system is, a little bit about why we think the lymphatic system is important in relation to neurodegeneration. Then about um, our uh, appropriation of light sheet microscopy and some data using light sheet microscopy. 
that we used to study the lymphatic system and the pigs. And then I'm going to go through um, some more considerations that you might want to take into account when you decide on whether or not to use light sheet microscopy. But first, I will actually start talking about the cerebrospinal fluid. So it's produced in the choroid plexus here in the ventricles. And this is the ventricular system you see here. Most people know the CSF as a way to measure biomarkers. But how do the biomarkers actually get to the brain? So what you see here is the progression of Alzheimer's um, uh, disease. But you also see that the first detectable event is the presence of amyloid beta in the CSF. So then that begs the question, how do these biomarkers produced inside the brain actually get to the CSF? This is something that the lymphatic system can explain. So it was discovered in 2012 in the lab of Michael Niedergaard, and it is a system of a perivascular influx of CSF. So the CSF is circulating in the subarachnoid space, and when these um, PL surface IVs turn into penetrating IVs, the fluid, the CSF, will actually follow. And you also see here that these IVs are bounded by the astrocytes uh, surrounding them. And we know now that the echo point four channels expressed in the astrocytes are vital for the distribution of CSF from the CSF spaces to the brain parenchyma. So in essence, the lymphatic system um, is a fluid transport system. First, we have the influx of the clean CSF and this in turn mediates clearance of solutes from the parenchyma. So it's a brain clearance system. And interestingly, it's only active in the sleep state. And luckily for us, also um, when anesthetized when, with certain anesthetics that have a, a high proportion of um, delta waves resembling normal sleep. So there are some very interesting uh, links between sleep and neurodegeneration um, that the lymphatic system um, might actually be able to explain. So it was uh, known from previous studies that sleep deprivation in Alzheimer's mice cause uh, exacerbation of the plaque load in these mice. Also in humans, it was later shown that the more hours that we sleep, the less amyloid we have in the brain. So the lymphatic system sparked a new interest in sleep as a way to prevent Alzheimer's disease. So we think that the lymphatic system is also important you know, to study in relation to Alzheimer's disease, for example. And then some links between aquaporin 4 channels which in the brain are only expressed by astrocytes and Alzheimer's disease. Here we see uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, mice of the type, type APP, PS1. And what you see here is that when the mice were crossed um, with aquaporin 4 uh, deletion mice, uh, knockout mice, there was an exacerbation of the amyloid and pathology and also the mice showed uh, worse um, uh, cognitive performance when the lymphatic system was inhibited in the point 4 knockout mice. So we know now that point 4 knockout um, exacerbates the AD pathology in mice. Also, in, in postmortem studies, Aquaporin 4 localization to the vasculature. So the correct um, localization of aquaporin 4 was found to be disrupted in Alzheimer's disease patients. 
So this is why, some of the reasons why, we think the lymphatic system is very important to study in order to prevent neurodegenerative diseases. So now to some of the light sheet studies that we did. We have some cleared mice and our ultramicroscopic blaze light sheet microscope. So how do we make tissues transparent? Or we can also ask why are tissues not transparent? So you probably noticed something that uh, when a light, uh, when light travels through different uh, kind of um, materials, it will change direction. So here you see, for example, when a light beam is first traveling through air, then it changes direction when um, when it enters and exits a you know, gel. So this is the same thing that is happening in our tissues. So this is because of the differences in the refractive indices. So light is both um, absorbed and uh, it is also refracted. So particularly when uh, when light moves through a an aqueous solution, which would be inside or outside the cells, and then when they move through a cell membrane that has a high lipid content. So the the most kind of basic um, premise for 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 optical clearing is a homogenization of refractive indices. So this will make the tissues appear more transparent. And the basic uh, steps that we use is um, dehydration, delipidation, the optical clearing, so uh, substitution of um, effective uh, indices using another solution. And then we can use it for light shade microscopy. Interestingly, the first version of optical clearing was actually performed more than 100 years ago um, by Spalzifals. And um, he uh, used optical uh, clearing in this little bit more primitive form uh, so that he could uh, draw human organs to, um, to use in atlases. Today, there are a number of different um, protocols available. We use the, the DISCO series, and specifically we use iDISCO Plus. And we have substituted uh, one uh, chemical that I will mention later. So, uh, so yeah, this is the general uh, steps which consist in just changing solutions. So it's a very easy uh, method. And we have substituted uh, dipensile ether for ethyl cinnamide. As ethyl cinnamide has the same effective index, but it is non-toxic. Actually, it's used as a food additive. Then, if you want to clear nut organs, but for example, whole mice, you can also do this with a few uh, additional steps. So here we have used the V disco method and we've performed decolorization and decalcification and then our regular steps. And um, here we have also injected a dye in the CSF and um, we can now see this in the whole uh, body of the mouse. And we also see here how the green channel, uh, 4A8 channel, can be used to obtain uh, structural information. So uh, it has higher background than the other channels. It can be a pain if the fluorophore of interest <clears throat> is in the green spectrum, but if not, it's very good to, 
to get the whole uh, structure. Okay, so light sheet microscopy. The principle is very simple. Uh, the illumination uh, comes uh, uh, not in the same uh, direction as uh, the lens, but comes perpendicular to the imaging lens. And um, uh, often you will see illumination from both sides. And then the light sheet is stable, but the sample moves um, up and down so that you can capture the whole, the whole sample. So when you use the technology as, for example, the ultramanoscope place, we we'll use uh, six um, sheets of light, uh, three from each side. And you see how compared to only left or right side illumination, you gain a little bit more detail by using uh, illumination from both sides. And some, some light sheet microscopes also have the software, so they actually adjust um, the light sheet and the imaging. So one image, one field of view is uh, made up by, uh, by many different uh, images so that the light sheet is as focused as possible on that field of view. So this is uh, one of the very new microscopes on the market, Ultramaxcope Blaze, that we're very happy with. Uh, and I will go through um, uh, some of the specifications. So here you see our beautifully cleared uh, mice. <laughs> Uh, this is in air, and when immersed in fluid, they become even more transparent. So this is what we used uh, for our um, for our light sheet imaging. But I should say here, when we first set up the technique, we were using the previous version, the Ultramax Group 2. Um, and so using the light sheet microscopy to image the lymphatic system for the first time, we felt that it was necessary to run some tests. So here we compared osteofluorin and aesthetics, where we know that the lymphatic system is suboptimally active. And we compared this to uh, ketamine cyanosine um, and cytized mice, where we know that the lymphatic system should be equally active as in the sleep state. So here we see um, the results from 3D reconstructions. So we found that we were able to reproduce the differences between the isoflurane and putting silicine um, in the CCR regimens when we used uh, light sheet microscopy. And we also found that, of course, we could, uh, by sampling the entire brain with uh, light sheet imaging into thousand images of the mouse brain, we were able to perform additional uh, segmentations. And we also saw that the lymphatic system was more impaired in the, in the dorsal and the anterior parts when using isoflurane instead of. So then um, going forward, we are interested in using uh, machine, machine learning algorithms to investigate the lymphatic system in the entire mouse brain. But uh, so far we have used, uh, we have used a machine learning algorithm to segment out the musculature. So not the vascular tree, but the vascular tree. So we have seen that in, uh, in the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model, which is a model of MS, we had observed that these mice were hypoxic, <clears throat> which could be partially reverted um, by inhalation of 100% oxygen. 
So we wanted to um, to analyze the perfused vasculature. So we used an intravascular dye that would on, only label the vasculature uh, of the perfused blood vessels. And we saw that um, in terms of the perfused vasculature, we're able to, um, <clears throat> to here for the spinal cord, determine the total perfused length and the perfused radius of the vasculature and the bifurcation point by combining light tube imaging and machine learning algorithms in collaboration with the Ali Turk lab in Munich. Then we also used light tube microscopy to study the glymphatic system in higher mammals. So besides this obvious difference in size, the, uh, the plate brain here is also a gyroencephalic so it has uh, gyri and sauci in between, whereas the mouse brain is lysencephalic, smooth. Also, the pig brain has larger arterioles, whereas the mouse brain mainly consists of capillaries. And um, other, uh, other advantages for using um, larger mammals, such as pigs, is that they have a more uh, similar physiology um, to humans. So what we saw here in the, in the pig brain was that um, the glymphatic system, and here we are tracking uh, fluorescent CSF, and we're looking at how it distributes to the pig brain. Here we have a coronal uh, slice, and we saw that uh, the CSF dye uh, was very uh, concentrated in these fissures and sulci of the pig brain. And what was very important was that the tracer we are seeing in purple was also localized in the perivascular space between endothelial cells and astrocytes on the outside. So this tells us that the kind of micro architecture of the glymphatic system is the same. So in larger uh, mammals, when we see CSF distributed to the brain, it also uh, does that in a perivascular manner. Then we did some light sheet microscopy. Now we have you know, the surface of, of the brain, then we're looking at the inside of the brain. And this is just the, the the very lowest magnification uh, that we can actually use. So what you see here is this very robust and, and highly regular pattern of CSF influx here in white, and just moving into the brain. Into the brain is up in this direction. So that's the cortex. And then in the hippocampus, we see here some larger vessels where the CSF tracer was able to move much further than uh, along the smaller caliber blood vessels. And when doing a comparison here, we saw that the, the entry points for CSF efflux was about four times higher in pigs than in the mouse cortex. And uh, we also uh, saw that the CSF uh, traveled further along the larger caliber uh, arterials. So we believe that the glymphatic system is, is not only conserved, but is also uh, perhaps even evolutionarily enhanced in larger mammals. So to summarize here for the um, parts on the glymphatic system, the glymphatic system is a clearance system that uses perivascular pathways. So it's kind of piggybacking on the vasculature, but it is moving only in the perivascular pathways. Light sheet imaging is feasible uh, for glymphatic studies. We saw that 
in the saucy and vicious in the large gyrified brain act as highways for recessive movement. So um, we found that the glymphatic system is evolutionarily conserved, if not enhanced, by the gyrification of large brains. And as I mentioned before, uh, the glymphatic system may provide uh, links as to uh, why uh, sleep and good sleep quality um, is uh, reducing the risk for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So we're very interested in studying the glymphatic system um, with the hope to, to find out how it works with the goal to be able to enhance or just sustain this function in aging. And now to some um, considerations. Um, if you if you want to get into light sheet um, microscopy, um, so we'll go through uh, some specifications here and some considerations. First, the size of the sample. So I would say if you're only planning to use uh, a few hundred uh, uh, microns, uh, say up to maybe 100 microns of thickness, then you may even use a confocal microscope. But if you have whole uh, uh, organs uh, of, of mice and so on, then um, you can benefit from using light sheet microscopy. So here, so you want to, in terms of the sample size, you want to be able to, uh, to of course, physically fit it into your uh, chamber, and you also want to check the, the travel range of the microscope. In addition to this, we also have to consider the working distance, because this means here for our uh, 1x lens, the working distance is 1.7 centimeters which is some of the highest working distance for the microscopes out there at the moment, actually. And that would mean that uh, if your sample is 1.7 centimeters thick, then it means to image the bottom, the lens is actually on the top of the sample. So you see how this varies with different uh, magnifications of lenses. Then your resolution. Can you get the resolution that you want? So for this, you want to, of course, look at the, the, the lens magnification, or the total magnification, including the zoom, and your numerical aperture, <clears throat> which give you, gives you this, uh, this maximum uh, resolution. The image quality. The image quality, here you want to uh, look at how many light sheets can you get. So six, this would be three from each side. Then your uh, thickness, this is your light sheet thickness. We usually use five microns. And then is your clearing protocol uh, compatible? Here, you want to look at the compatibility with refractive indices. And often you will find that you can use both the uh, water-based um, protocol or a um, DBE or ethan cinemate based protocol. Then how much throughput uh, can you get? This, of course, depends on how much you can uh, fit into the microscope, but also uh, in terms of the software, if you can um, if you can set up the microscope for acquiring uh, several samples in one uh, session. So it's more um, automated. So the previous uh, ultramicroscope uh, two uh, we had was from Levision Biotech that was later bought by Miltane Biotech. Here we had to split the mouse head in two to, to fit it in the chamber size. 
Now with the new microscope, we can image the whole head. Now we've injected dye in the CSF and we're moving through the head to the periphery here, from the brain to the periphery. And we're gonna loop back. So we see here the brain in its entirety and we also see some cervical lymph nodes. So uh, this new microscope has been a big um, improvement in terms of technology for us. Okay, so some more considerations um, uh, here. So, so you can use uh, organ only, for example, with the iDisco protocol, or you can use the whole body. Here you have to um, continuously um, diffuse um, the different uh, chemicals, solutions uh, into the body. Then, um, then what kind of fluorophore will you be using? Do you have an endogenous uh, or injective fluorophore? So we are so lucky to use our uh, CSF injected fluorophores. You may have, for example, um, a reporter mouse with fluorescence protein. Uh, and if not, you are of course reliant on antibody staining. But having said that, you might want to be aware that if you use uh, fluorescent reporters, and this includes uh, GFP reporters, you might need uh, amplification of the signal by antibody labeling. Because some of these uh, fluorescence um, proteins uh, are not as bright after the whole clearing protocol. So if you want to use uh, antibody labeling, there's a number of protocols out there. Uh, it is good to check um, in published papers if someone has uh, used antibodies against the epitope that you are interested in as uh, antibody labeling requires uh, optimization for each antibody. And some antibodies may not um, actually work. So here, for example, you can do a methanol uh, uh, test to see um, whether the antibody still works. And uh, if not, you can try another antibody. This is if you use a, a methanol in your uh, clearing protocol, of course, as we do. So uh, some summary here on the light sheet microscopy part. So you want to consider your sample size. If you have a sample size less than 100 microns, you may be able to use confocal. If you use uh, larger sample sizes, you do have to check the, the sample size and the specifications of your light sheet microscope. Uh, several microscopes, they can only image one uh, cubic centimeter. Then, in terms of the clearing protocol, if you use, uh, uh, if your sample is one organ, you can get away with a simpler protocol, but you can even clear whole bodies of mice using other clearance protocols. Then you can also consider uh, substituting some of the toxic chemicals. For example, uh, the dibenzyl ether, which is, a, which is the last step of the Edisco Plus protocols, um, because this means that this will be the liquid that you use um, in the microscope also. So only few um, institutions will have their light sheet microscope uh, placed with ample uh, point suction. So here uh, you can replace, for example, the DBE to, um, to ethyl cinnamate so that um, you're not exposed to toxic chemicals while imaging. Yeah, consider your fluorophores if you can uh, use um, fire red uh, fluorophores 
this is recommended as they uh, penetrate the tissues uh, better. Remember that um, the most autofluorescence you will get on the green channel, so in the GFP spectrum. And um, antibodies uh, will not always uh, work with the clearing protocols. So, so each antibody has to be uh, tested. So it can also be an idea to test several antibodies in parallel. So with that, I would like to thank my amazing uh, team and um, uh, Tekla and um, Marius and Na and Nick have been working a lot with the light sheet imaging in the lab. I would like to thank uh, Collaborator who uh, has helped with the machine learning algorithms for segmenting out the, the vascular compartment, Ali Atuk in Munich. I would like to thank my funding and I would like to thank Labroads for hosting this webinar. And with that, I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Eben, for your informative presentation. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, which tissues are the hardest to clear? Yep. Yeah. So, um... I can uh, I can start by uh, uh, saying that I'm fortunate to work with uh, with brain tissue and brain tissue clears amazingly, um, but for example, it's known that uh, hemoglobin uh, gives a lot of autofluorescence, uh, so this is why you start with a diffusion step, but also myoglobin, so that would be in muscle tissue, including the heart. Um, so I would say the muscle tissue is probably the tissue that, that is the hardest to clear. Uh, however, there is um, at least one uh, paper that, that describes uh, that test different kind of clearing protocols um, uh, for, for clearing of the heart. So I would say that any, any tissue um, can be cleared. Great, thank you. Our next question asks, what can be done if the GFP reporter is not working? Uh, yes, this is actually something that uh, we are dealing with uh, at the moment. Uh, so we have a reporter mouse expressing EGFP and, uh, and uh, unfortunately uh, the GFP signal is not visible after uh, the clearing. So what we're trying now is that we're using uh, nanobody uh, labeling. So this means it's a truncated version. So it's a smaller molecular weight version of an antibody, uh, which is uh, directly co conjugated to fluorophore. So we're basically amplifying the EGFP signal uh, in that way. Uh, and we're also testing other uh, clearance protocols than the disco family of protocols that we normally use uh, in order to to retain the EGFP signal in our reporter mice. Great. Our next question asks, how many channels can be imaged with light sheet microscopy? Mm -hmm. Yes. So on our light sheet, microscope we have uh, seven uh, um, emission excitation filters uh, or excitation emission filters uh, installed but uh, at the moment we would like to stick to two uh, fluorophores and um, but so we know for example that the fire red uh, fluorophores very good 
we also know that in the lowest uh, nanometer range, so for the blue light, uh, it carries the most uh, energy, uh, but therefore is absorbed more and thus penetrates the tissue less. So right now we're actually only doing uh, two fluorophores, uh, green and far red, uh, but I've seen other labs that managed to get uh, the solution of, of more fluorophores than that. Great, thank you. Our next question asks, how relevant is the order of clearing steps for the results? For example, decolorization and declarification prior or after dehydration or permeabilization? Okay, that is a good question. Uh, we haven't tried to, to switch the order. So of course that could be tried, but I believe it makes perhaps uh, more sense to do the decolorization step uh, first, because I think this is more water soluble. And then if you are using the DISCO protocols as we are, you are later dehydrating uh, the tissue. Uh, so after that, you don't want to reintroduce water molecules because then you have, um, yeah, then you have solvents, uh, but not actually uh, water. Great, our next question is, was the cubic LR method successful in your hands? <laughs> uh, we, we haven't tried it uh, yet, but uh, due to this um, issue with, uh, with the loss of fluorescence in our EGFP reporter miles, um, we may we may actually try that, but we haven't we haven't tried it yet. Thank you. Our next question is: What is the main advantage of light screen microscopy? Yeah, the main advantage. Yeah, that's a nice question. So, so I would say this is this is for the for the mesoscale or, or perhaps even microscopic um, imaging. So if you, if you have a, a tiny sample, like I said, less than 100 microns, then the confocal microscopy, um, I would probably find would be superior. So, so it's really, really useful when, when you have larger samples, um, such as, uh, mouse organs or even um, if you want to image the whole mouse body because there you get you get a much much improved resolution uh, to for example a, a CT or MRI uh, uh, imaging so so this is this is really the the advantage is the, the improved resolution for larger samples. Great, and it looks like we have one more question here today, and that is, are you open to collaborations? Uh, yes, yes, we are often uh, open to collaborations and um, we, we really love uh, this technique and uh, we found it pretty uh, easy to to get started so we'll be happy to help others to uh, to get started or do test uh, imaging of their samples if they don't have a light shade microscope in their institution uh, so so yeah i i find this uh, technique very uh, very fascinating and uh, and um yeah, has really helped us to to answer more uh, of our research questions. So we would be happy to help uh, other groups get started with this. Great, thank you, Ivan. And it looks like we have one more question that actually came in here, and it asks, "How do you use titrate antibodies for three D microscopy?" Microscopy. Uh, yes. Good question. So a little bit uh, primitive, but but perhaps a standard uh, way. Um, what we do is that we would try um, we would try 
three concentrations of antibody. One would be um, the same antibody as we would use for a normal, say, slice uh, staining. And then we would go a little bit uh, under, and then we would go um, perhaps several times higher than that. So this would be um, yeah, a test that we would run um, in parallel or simultaneously, because uh, yeah, the antibody penetration uh, takes um, for the brain, say, a week, and for uh, larger samples, we would use three weeks. Uh, so, uh, so we would always run these different concentrations in, in parallel. Great, thank you. We have another question that came in here, and it says, the disadvantage of light screen microscopy, is it difficult to perfectly align both light sheets in three-dimensional space? So what, you want, what do you have to say about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that this question um, could be maybe relevant based on the exact type of light sheet um, microscope that you use. Uh, so we, um, I, I believe we're, we're quite fortunate with the model that, that we have now. And uh, I don't get uh, paid to advertise with this uh, microscope, but but I really find it fantastic. Um, so so and what what this new uh, and particular model of the light sheet microscope does is that for one field of view, uh, it will actually adjust um, the light sheet so so that it would take. Uh, multiple images, I think maybe a standard of uh, 32 images, uh, just to put into one image for one field of view. So we haven't had any issues with the alignment. Uh, I believe it's done maybe in the service check once a year. Um, and it works uh, beautifully the rest of the time. Uh, so at least for the model that we use, it's, it's not an issue. And, and the software um, additions, like I said, that it is um, capturing many images to get one field of view. Uh, this, is, this is a really good improvement for, for, the, for the image quality uh, to get it really crisp, everything in focus and illuminated. Uh, so, so for us, alignment of the light sheet has not been an issue. Great, thank you so much, Eben. It looks like that brings us to the end of our Q&A session for today. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, well, I'd just uh, like to say thank you for attending this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you for the questions. They're all uh, great questions. and. Uh, and I hope that this has uh, spurred you on to, to perhaps use a uh, light sheet for, for your own uh, research. Great, thank you again, Eben, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Milteni Biotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions we did not have time for today, and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>